Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin wa salatu wa salamu al-ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd fa'a'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim bismillahirrahmanirrahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to try and cover hadith number 9 and 10. So hadith number 9 is again agreed upon, mutafakkun ilay. It is uh, mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, both. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, avoid that which I forbid you to do and do that which I command you to do to the best of your capacity. Verily, the people before you were destroyed only because of their excessive questioning and their disagreement with their prophets. Very important hadith again. Uh, we always see the background of a hadith. Reasons and background of a hadith is very important to enable us to understand its meaning. And this particular hadith, is very important example. It's a very good example of understanding, uh, you know, uh, why knowledge of background can help us to really understand a hadith. This particular hadith was related during an incident where Prophet وسلم, he told his people that Allah has commanded you to perform Hajj. So perform Hajj, O servants of Allah. Then a man, he stood up and he said, O Prophet of Allah, do we have to do it every year? And on this, the Prophet said that whatever I forbid you to do, avoid it. And whatever I command you to do, do it as much as you can. This is the background of this hadith. A few lessons here. This particular incident, it took place at a time of revelation, meaning it was revealed, uh, this hadith took place when Quran was being revealed. And asking too many questions uh, about an obligation may lead to complications and confusions. Let me just give you an example. You know, some of us are so eager uh, to learn things and very fast in picking things up. And, uh, and I'm sure all of us must have experienced, uh, either you have experienced it or you have experienced with other people around you, that there's a class going on, maybe in your school days or college days, and teacher is trying to explain a concept step by step. She's taking everybody along, right? And then you or maybe someone else would just immediately raise hand and say, oh, but what about this? What if this happens? What if that happens? And what does the teacher say? She says, like, you know, let me complete. And once I'm done, I'll take your questions. If you're still confused about certain things, I'll take your questions. So basically what she's implying is that the way I'm explaining, inshallah, a lot of things will be covered in that. But unnecessarily disrupting the class and asking things, you know, jumping to conclusions is, is not a good idea, right? And here, Prophet وسلم, also is not very happy with this question raised by this man because this could have caused the Hajj to be performed every year by each Muslim if the answer was yes to that question. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have said, all right, you have to do it every year and it's mandatory for everybody. Anything was possible. Things were being explained. Prophet وسلم, was you know, step by step taking the, the Muslim uh, ummah uh, bringing them to Sharia. Um, so this was not uh, appreciated by the messenger sallallahu However, asking questions in the right way is encouraged. Because, you know, uh, and, and we have seen that in the first hadith that Prophet sallallahu he had this habit of asking questions before giving an answer. So this is a very good teaching technique that you ask questions, but who's going to do that? The teacher is going to do that. And then of course, uh, it'll make the students or the audience think about it. And then the instructor or the teacher would give a conclusive statement. 
So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took help of questions and answers to educate his companions. He did that. But questions that lead to knowledge and goodness uh, are, uh, you know, which do not lead to knowledge and goodness are discouraged. If the whole idea of asking something is, you know, because it's going to clarify things, and especially once the whole picture is in front of you, that should be fine. What is prohibited, what is discouraged are the questions that would lead to, con uh, to confusions. That is something which is being talked about here. This would have led to doubt and chaos in the community. Um, so asking uh, questions about unnecessary details, especially, should not, not be done. And if you remember, in case of uh, the incident with Bani Israel, that's exactly what happened. You know, the, uh, Musa alayhi salam asked them to slaughter a cow. What did they do? Tons of questions. They wanted detailing. And when you ask too many details, you're basically making things difficult for yourself. There's a very natural uh, tendency. Whenever you kind of uh, want to be more specific, then you get specification. So if you have like a general command coming to you, the best thing to do is what? That you just, Samayana wa ta'ana. I listen and I, you know, I hear and I listen. That should be the approach. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we'll find the commands uh, you know, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, easy, practical, doable, inshallah. Now, what does it mean when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, uh, do it to the best of your capacity. Hmm? I command you to do to the best of your capacity. What does that mean? See, one significant quality of Islam is that it is very flexible. It is very practical. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but yes, Islam is very flexible and is very practical. Allah always keeps our ability into consideration when we are expected to fulfill any obligation. He does that. We are encouraged to do good deeds based on our ability and capacity, right? Um, and look at the example of Hajj. Hajj is done when one has the ability and resources to do so. However, if one is tied up with loans, etc., or with other clashing obligations, then there is room for delaying it for other time. We have, alhamdulillah, that we know that. Look at other uh, modes of worship. For example, salah. What happens? We're supposed to perform it at a preferred time. The awal work for the first four salah and isha should be done you know, uh, uh, in the in the, the latter hours. Uh, however, due to unavoidable circumstances, we can, uh, you know, perform them later within the specified time. We can do that. There is a big window, literally uh, a good decent window in most of the salahs, you know, the salawats that we have. Similarly, a person who is not able to stand, for example, in salah, he may pray while sitting. So there is flexibility. Likewise, we see flexibility in other worships too, like fasting. Uh, for example, one may break the fast while traveling or if he's sick and you can make it up on other days. So the first thing is to appreciate the flexibility and ease in our modes of worship. It's absolutely there. What does shaitan make us think? He makes us say and think, you know, oof, it's so difficult to be a practicing Muslim. It's not easy these days, you know. Namaz, namaz all the time. You get up from, from the janamaz and there you get to hear another azan going on. Always remember the forms of worship that we do, Allah doesn't need them. He has angels worshiping him 24-7. The reason for five times salah is for us. We need to remain connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through all different modes of worship, different types of worship. Now, how do we feel, you know, or how do we, you know, connect with, how do we feel when uh, we've got our menstrual cycle going on? How do I connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Am I really able to have the same kind of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when, when, you know, when we get our periods? Uh -huh. And perhaps one of the wisdom in having that break is to realize how badly we need to do those five times prayers. We badly need 
I have literally experienced this, and I'm sure a lot of people must have experienced that you're dying to read the Quran. You're dying to go on Masallah and do your sajda and all of that. Um, and you, you can literally sometimes feel you're missing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're missing on that connection that you have. So yes, there is a lot of hikmah behind it. And that is one thing. Our deen is very flexible. Always keep reminding yourself. And where flexibility is really needed, Allah gives us options. Alhamdulillah. The second thing, which is uh, even more important to understand is that the forbidden must be totally avoided. There is absolutely no flexibility there. You can't say, you know, I'm usually very sleepy at Fajr time, uh, really can't concentrate in my namaz. Hence, I do it at 10 a.m. when I am really alert. I have more khushu in my namaz when I do my Fajr at 10 a.m. Can you justify that? Of course not. I feel so hot in summer and I really can't wear this outer covering, you know, implying uh, towards abaya. Uh, and Allah knows it's difficult for me. Uh, he is, of course, always forgiving. Can you use that as justification? No, you cannot. Forget about the things clearly defined as permissible or not permissible. Allah wants us to stay, uh, you know, away from prohibited acts so much so that whatever leads to haram, all those acts which are not even haram, but they lead to haram, right? That must be avoided as well. Things like, you know, things that are makru, things that are not, you know, uh, they are not according to the ethos of Islam. We're supposed to avoid that too. It might not be haram. It might just lead you to haram. We're supposed to avoid that as well. Doubtful matters. We've done hadith on that, right? So this is the approach that we need to have. Also, while talking about nasiha to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we had discussed that getting closer to Allah is not possible with just focusing on halal and haram. It doesn't happen. We have to uh, rise above that and focus on even avoiding doubtful matters, avoiding makru acts, and focus a lot on nawafil, the optional acts. We have to do all of that if you want to strive to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the very same concept is being talked about here as well. If you need that bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you will have to, you know, stop measuring everything in, you know, in the scales of what is halal and what is haram, right? Along with that, there is a flip side to this concept as well. We should also not attach hardship to any good deed or act. Unnecessarily, we shouldn't do that. You are not going to, it wouldn't become rewarding just because you're, you know, kind of attaching hardship to it. This is not part of our deen. Christians do that. Hindus do that. Buddhists do that. We are not supposed to do it. So if there is an easier option, provided there is an easier option, one should not use the harder one. So there are two options given to us by Prophet ﷺ through the verses of the Quran, then I can go for the easier option. For example, if you can afford to stay in a six-star, five-star hotel for your hajj, Hmm? If we have the option, do it. Alhamdulillah. Hardship, hardship is not intended by you know, the Sharia. It should be avoided if you have the resources. However, when there is no other choice, like you can hardly afford a room in, you know, in sharing during Hajj, then the reward for the person will be higher for the hardship uh, that he has to go through because of limited resources. He will be rewarded for that because he doesn't have choice. He has to opt for a room where he has to share it with a few other people, right? Kasar Salah is an ease given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not fetching any extra reward if you're doing complete namaz during your traveling. You are not really because that is ease provided to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more rewarding would be that we avail that ease. So this is a concept that we have to understand in every concept of Islam, my God, shows us that we have to strike balance between two extremes, right? The very same principle applies to other good actions uh, that are not compulsory, but they're encouraged. Uh, and we should do them as much as we can, looking at our potential, looking at our resources, for example, helping others, 
How much am I going to help others? Giving sadka, how much am I going to give sadka? You'll have to see your resources and then decide. Fasting outside of Ramadan, all of the optional worships should be done in moderation. But the question is, what is moderation? How would you define moderation? Well, it's different for different people. It depends on your situation. It depends on your experience. It depends on your stamina for worship. There are quite a lot of elements involved in that. Someone who barely does five times prayers. Now, this person is not expected to stand in long qiyam in the middle of the night. It's going to very seriously backfire after a day or two. So just being enthusiastic will never suffice. One needs to build on one's stamina by doing bite-sized ibadah at night. Maybe start with two nafil just before fajr and then slowly and gradually build upon, just build on it. And same goes for other optional worships like reading the Quran and all of that. If you will start reading, you know, uh, three paras every day, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? after the sixth day or the seventh day, you'll get tired, you'll get exhausted because you haven't built up the stamina. So you start with little bite size and slowly and gradually, and that's the trick, slowly and gradually you build upon it. Just as you see a two year old toddler, he looks very cute when he's walking the way he does. But if you see a 40 year old man walking like a toddler, how, how are you going to feel about him? you'll find him abnormal. So yes, we have to grow. We have to build up our stamina. We can't just sit on whatever I was doing, let's say, you know, six years back and say that, you know, I, 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 that's enough for me. I can't do more than that, right? Also, we must not uh, make any commitment to strictly perform an act at a fixed time if it is not time bound. Let me give you an example. You decide that I am going to do Tasbih or Zikrullah every day at 5 a.m. in the morning. Really good. That's, you know, you're disciplining yourself. You should be doing that. Uh, but it's fine if you delay it a day or two. You know, uh, you, one day you're doing at 5, the other day you're doing at 5.30. It's fine. You know, it's not for Salah that you have to do it uh, at the early hours. And you can even skip it on, you know, some days when you're not feeling well or you're tired. Don't be too hard on yourself when you are trying to discipline in, in doing, uh, you know, ibadah, which is uh, not obligatory. Uh, do, doing it daily or doing it at 4 a.m. is not really mandatory. Nobody made it compulsory. It was self-induced hardship on yourself. If you're going to, even if you're, you know, sick, even you're extremely tired, you're still sitting there and doing zikrullah at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. 5 a.m., right? This is eventually going to create that resentment for the worship that you're doing. And you're going to just like, you know, stop doing it altogether. So we should do it with ease within our own capacity and slowly and gradually build on that. That's the trick. Or, you know, for example, uh, we shouldn't be making it compulsory that I'm going to fast every Monday and Thursday, no matter what happens. You do it as much as you are able to uh, do comfortably and then break it from time to time. That's the trick. If you try to commit yourself strictly to a particular schedule in these matters, they may burden you and you may finally just get fed up and you just you won't want to quit them. And this is a very normal pattern that we see uh, around ourselves, maybe with, with, with ourselves, that you, know, you get enthusiastic about certain things, you do it for a few days and then something happens and you know and you're thrown off thrown off the track and you never go back on it it seems like a dream that you know you used to recite uh, the quran for half an hour it would seem like a dream that you were memorizing the quran it would seem like a dream that you used to do the hajj and all of that and on this issue prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he also said the acts most pleasing to allah are those uh, which are done continuously even if they are small Again, it's all about striking balance. I have literally uh, seen people quoting this particular hadith and saying, discouraging people from doing a little extra if they want to. If somebody, your children or you know, your loved ones are willing to you know, take the plunge, let them, let them, but keep telling them, you know, to do it 
have your target, have high targets for yourself, but then go bit by bit, but never pull them down. Never say, no, 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 no. If your, let's say, a 13 year old child wants to do tahajjud, as long as they're doing five times prayers on their own, if they want to do tahajjud, let them. If they want to do tahajjud during their exam days, let them. If they are being nice to you, extra nice to you during their exams day, but this is something that I've <laughs> experienced a lot. You know, all of a sudden my children would become so nice to me because, you know, they all of a sudden have this level of taqwa, <laughs> very, very high, doing all types of, uh, you know, charity work and this and that and being nice to mom and, you know, uh, you know being nice to everybody around. So let them, let them. This is how they'll get the flavor of, you know, doing that extra mile for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let them, never discourage them, but just keep guiding them and, you know, letting them know that, you know, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, you know, how do you think uh, Allah would feel when all of a sudden, once your exams finish, all of a sudden you're not even doing your five times prayers. So at least stick to your five times prayers and you can have this, you know, you can discipline yourself that during exams days, since I'm getting up early in the morning, I'm going to do my tahajjud as well. Absolutely no issues in that, right? Now, there are some exceptions to this particular hadith, which can be understood from the Quran and Sunnah. When Prophet Sallallahu he forbade the haram, the general rule is to avoid them, right? However, there are exceptions. Uh, like, you know, there is a necessity and when there is a clash between a minor and a major harm, then we will opt for the minor harmful act. I'll give an example. You know, let's say there is a situation where it is necessary to eat something, right, which is uh, forbidden. Uh, you might just starve yourself to death. You face the risk of losing uh, your life. In this particular case, a greater harm is avoided by, by tolerating the minor harm. So you are allowed to, for example, you are in some rainforest and there's no food except for in, you know, uh, a big juicy pork steaks. Yeah. And, and well, you have to do it, but you have to do it with, uh, you know, discontent in your heart. That's the important thing, but you can eat that, if not eating that would uh, cost you your life. So this principle is called by the scholars weighing between benefits and harm. So you have to, there are certain situations uh, which are exception to the main uh, principle and the rule where you kind of see the benefits and harm and decide if something is allowed, if something you can, is, is something that you can do or not. And who's going to give permission for that? There are scholars sitting, right? And they have rulings passed on certain situations where you can indulge into uh, haram for, for a temporary uh, period of time and then just come out of it, yeah? Acha. So uh, how would we conclude this, this particular hadith? Uh, understanding and practicing the principles that we have just talked about may lead us to live a better and practical life. We have to be practical. Our worship has to be sustainable, right? And eventually, uh, it will lead us to love and continuously practice good deeds. And you do it wholeheartedly. You do it with a very happy attitude and not consider them as burden. This is the whole idea behind this hadith, right? Now we move on to hadith number 10. The messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, verily, Allah, the exalted, is pure. He does not accept but that which is pure. Allah commands the believers with what he commanded the messengers. Allah, the Almighty has said, O oh, you messengers, eat of the good things and act righteously. Right? Uh, and then, in other words, he says, uh, uh, O oh, you who believe, eat of the good things that we have provided, uh, provided you with. Right? So one of the verses is from... Uh, Surah Mu'min and the other one is from Surah Baqarah. Acha. Then the Prophet mentioned the case of a man who having journeyed far is disabled and, and dusty and who stretches out his hands to the sky saying, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. While his food was unlawful, his drink was unlawful, his 
clothing was unlawful and he's nourished with unlawful things so how can he be answered again a very very heavy hadith i must say uh, but i'm going to break it down into few segments to understand all the elements of this hadith number one the term that verily allah the exalted is pure i think this is the easiest part to understand because it means that allah has all the attributes of perfection and and completeness he's free from any kind of shortcomings he's free from any kind of weakness or needs and so is his commands his sharia is also uh, does not have any weaknesses or shortcomings this is the meaning of the first part coming to the second part where uh, the messenger said and he does not accept but what uh, for, uh, uh, but that which is pure this part of the hadith actually refers to all good deeds allah does not accept any deeds that are spoiled by any aspect that may ruin it for example our deed uh, our deeds must be free from showing off we talked about in the first hadith right or allah does not accept it or while doing charity it will only be accepted if your wealth comes from legal sources <coughs> right that's very important if you think if you want to give charity go and do it but if, if your money is not halal that is not accepted as charity by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay i know it's a hard one it's a very hard pill to swallow but this is the fact then after this uh, allah commanded the believers the the uh, the mu'minun in the same manner as he commanded the messengers two quranic verses are mentioned at the end of the hadith both talking about what eating tayyib food now there's a difference between tayyib food and halal food halal is opposite to haram if something is not halal it is haram tayyib food inshallah we'll talk about it uh, but what are the verses that uh, which are which are mentioned here the first is oh messengers huh? it is uh, addressing to uh, more than one messenger right eat of the tayyibat this is from surah uh, mu'min and then o oh, you who believe eat of the tayyibat that we have provided you with both these uh, verses are talking about what we consume acha now there are of course very useful uh, rulings that can be derived from this hadith the first thing is what the money according to the scholars the money that the muslims earn has to be pure and legal has to be halal there is absolutely no option given here it has to be from halal ways and again i am reminding myself also and you um, we are not going into the fiqh of it uh, banking islamic banking and you know taking uh, you know sood and all of that uh, this this hadith is not about the fiqh element but we must know mota mota that the money that any muslim earns has to be pure and legal it has to be from halal means the second thing the food that we consume must be halal it should be lawful right the third thing is that the money with which a person buys food must be lawful coming from lawful sources see so these are the keys for acceptance of our deeds by allah subhanahu wa taala money has to be halal earning right you have to have halal earning the food that you consume must be halal jisme kosher da de aata hai jisme zabiha aur sari cheeze aa jate quite a lot of things right i'm not again going into the fic element of it and the money with which the food is bought has to be halal from halal resources theek hai halal sources now whether something is permissible or prohibited is by the will of allah subhanahu wa taala he is going to explain what is permissible and what what is prohibited he is going to guide us and he allah subhanahu wa taala tells us clearly what are permissible and what are not it's not for you and me to sit and discuss and debate right so allah has made it lawful and vice versa it is he who decides it it is actually allah's right to make things lawful or unlawful and the last thing is what earning and consuming lawful things are important conditions for acceptance of our dua by allah subhanahu wa taala 
right? There is, uh, uh, you know, uh, and we have hadith telling us that one of the things that stops uh, a person's uh, duas to be manifested is his sins. So it's very important to consume halal. It's very important to, you know, eat halal food and buy your halal food with halal money. All of that is has a very powerful impact on the acceptance of our dua, right? Now, so uh, there are certain adab, certain mannerism of making dua um, and uh, earning and consuming lawful things is one of them. And in other hadith, uh, there are other situations mentioned, like for example, when you're traveling, uh, there's some form of sickness, uh, when you are in the sajda, Allah, you know, listens to your dua uh, at the time of rainfall uh, during the, the last third of the night. So if you really want something desperately, you get up in the middle of the night, in the last third of the night and make dua, ask Allah, because there's a hadith that tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to the lowest heaven and he says, is there anybody who wants anything from me? Can you imagine? Yeah, so that's the time to desperately go into your sajda and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something which is like, you know, uh, really, really important for you. Um, then being humble in the dua is very important. That humility is very important. And to raise the hands uh, towards the sky, you lift your hands and making dua. That is also very important because there's another hadith. And the gist is that the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I shy away from a person who lifts his hand and asks for something. I shy away uh, not to give what he has asked for, right? So that's like a very powerful tool. Raise your hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just say, bheek nahi mangte, you know? Likewise, have that humility. And you know, that, that, uh, that feeling of, if you see a beggar raising his hands in front of you for asking for something, you know, what kind of, what do you think his state of mind is at that time? Hmm? And then, of course, along with this eagerness in performing the dua, you know, uh, such as uh, uh, asking Allah many, many times, like saying, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman. And, you know, constantly repeating your dua, Allah, give me health, Allah, give me health, Allah, give me health. So repeating what you want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your dua and repeating his attributes is, again, a very, very powerful thing to do in your dua. Uh, dua is one of the most important forms of ibadah and it is a high, you know, very high form of ibadah because it shows our need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in helping us. We are in need of Allah's mercy more than we need the air for breathing. So we need his help, we need his guidance, we need his mercy in every second and our every single moment in our lives. And most importantly, if we want Allah to respond to our duas, then we need to respond to his commandments, such as eating only that which is lawful to us. This is the least that we can do. You know, we have to show some form of sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some form of loyalty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being very careful what we eat. Achha. Another ruling from this hadith is that charity, sadqa, is only accepted by Allah if it is from lawful sources. An example is, you know, when a person steals money and he, use it, he uses it to perform the hajj. That hajj, by general consensus of, of, of all the scholars, is not acceptable. Right? It's not, uh, it's not acceptable. If this person better do another hajj with halal earned money. And in this context, we have Ibn Abbas, was, you know, he said that filth does not expiate filth. Filth does not expiate filth. So you can't be a Robin Hood, steal money, and then go and help people out. This doesn't work in Islam at all. Okay? Another explanation given by the scholars is about the issue of unlawfully using other people's belongings. And unfortunately, this part of the world, people are so careless about it. Like, you know, the property of a company, uh, you know, some organization or institution where you're working. This is a very, very important issue because public belongings that are wrongfully taken are a kind of stealing. I'm not saying it falls in the category of uh, theft, clearly, but it is like a shade of stealing. This is something that would nullify even shahada 
you know, dying in the way of Allah, it will nullify martyr. Why? There's a hadith about a martyr who took a small portion, a very small portion of the booty of the war. And the messenger, وسلم, he stated that this act nullified his shahada. What a sad ending to, you know, to have because of little worldly gains. And this is what we, we don't need that pencil that I picked up from, you know, from the counter. I really don't need that. But we do it because we're so careless. We think it's not stealing. Today, a lot of people take this issue for granted. They don't even consider this as stealing. For example, you know, taking paper or pen from the office for personal use. Another example is, you know, uh, personal use of the photocopy machine or company car or telephone and company money or any other instrument without getting the permission from the authority. If you have the permission to use the car that they've given you for your personal use, then there's no issue. But it is if there is something given to you, and you've been given a laptop just for your work, it has been specifically told, you've been told to you, this is for your work, you know, your uh, work-related things. Then if you're using it for something else, that is khayana. That is khayana. And it is, it is like you know, it's a shade of stealing. It's a shade of theft. We will also be held responsible if we, you know, kind of damage and vandalize public property and belongings. For example, you go to a park or you're sitting in a train and, you know, some people have got this bad habit of scribbling, you know, scratching things up with, you, with something hard, maybe pen or pencil. They would make a heart or write their name or just scribble over there. I mean, why do we do that? That's damaging public property. We're not supposed to do that. Very important. And a very good example of protecting oneself from such stealing uh, is of Khalifa uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He was one of the Khalifas. And he used one, he used to use one candle for his official work and would put it out once done. And he would then use his personal candle for any other personal work uh, that he needed to do. Such a beautiful example of how we should use things that don't belong to, her, uh, belong to us. For example, we need to turn off the lights and air conditioners when leaving, you know, uh, if we are working in an office, why don't we do that? You know, because we think it's not my responsibility. Uh, the, the PN is going to come and do it. Why? Why don't we own up? You know, I, I mean, this is an amana that AC air condition was maybe like, you know, turned on for my comfort when I was working. So if I'm leaving, choti choti baat hai. Do it as neki, do it as rewarding righteous deed. We will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in return, look at the return Allah promises. He will respond to our duas. Maybe that's something uh, that's lacking in my day-to-day -day dealing. Uh, we need to kind of like, you know, uh, focus on this. Also, we need to uh, create awareness among other people, especially our children, to be more responsible and not to indulge in, in this kind of irresponsible act. That's very important. In the West, again, unfortunately, these guys are so particular about this. So as I always say, if you really want to learn and copy them in something, these are the areas to you know, pick things from them, copy them. Because initially, these things were taught by our religion. We very conveniently exported it to the West. So we need to import them back. This is our values. Right. Um, then there is a com contemporary issue related to this hadith, and it is about um, uh, you know caring about what you eat in terms of uh, good things. So the first thing is to be aware of the ingredients of the food when dining in restaurant, you know, or uh, buying canned food, or uh, especially if it is imported, we need to ensure that they are lawful. We are talking about tayyib. We are talking about halal food and tayyib food. So this checking the ingredient could be for both the reasons, right? And then many of the things that we eat uh, are halal, but they may cause health problems. So yes, we have to see if all the ingredients are halal. We need to re read the ingredients. And along with that, we also have to read the ingredients and see what we are eating because what we eat may trigger some form of health problem. We need to be more aware about the healthy aspect of the food. Check if they are pure. Tayyab. It doesn't talk about haram food. It talks about tayyab food as well. Uh, 
So educate yourself, read up on preservatives, read up on you know, food coloring and chemicals that are used in the food. This is not being paranoid. It's absolutely not being paranoid. I think we all, we as Muslims, if we really want to keep ourselves fit to be able to do something before we die, we will have to uh, focus on our health and see what we eat. Harmful contents are not tayyab, right? So when we talk about tayyab food, we're talking about avoiding uh, things that may not be haram, but they are harmful for our health. And this can eventually have an effect on our spirituality as well. Now, how can an ill person worship? Tell me, doesn't our ibadah get affected when we are sick? Sometimes because of, uh, you know, of the ailment that we are, we are not able to, we are, we are, we are not able to stand or do sajda. Does our salah give us the same kind of satisfaction when we are able to stand and do sajda? Hmm? Does, you know, are, we, are we not able to do sajda or can't stand? No, we don't have that satisfaction. You ask people who, who've been very regular in their salah and all of a sudden because of some ailment, they're not able to do sajda. They're not able to do qayam. They're not able to stand. They feel that they haven't, literally haven't done salah. This is how incomplete it feels. But if somebody is looking for convenience, he'll say, Chalo, alhamdulillah, a bed ke aram se zindagi bar namaz parni hai. So it is, you know, uh, the attitude that we have. So the scholars, they say that whatever we eat, it affects our attitude. It affects our behavior. And we need to eat the right food. We need to eat tayyab food. And in the right manner as well. You need to know the adab as prescribed by Islam. You know, for example, not overeating. Uh, and, and then reduce, at least reduce, if we can't completely avoid unhealthy food. Right? Like, uh, for example, these days, and you must be updated with what the science is saying. Right? So, for example, these days, they talk about the four whites being literally being poison for you. Uh, the white sugar, the white flour, the white rice, and the white salt. Let's start from somewhere at least. We aren't born to eat. This isn't the real reason you and I were sent to this world. Yes, enjoy good food, but you can never go wrong in setting limitation for yourself, especially when it comes to your health. Because tomorrow, God forbid, God forbid, if you are bedridden, people that you know you try and keep up with, by eating all kinds of junk because you don't want to be, uh, you know, the wet blanket, so to say, you're, you're willing to eat just about anything, how many of them are actually going to come pick you up and take you to the washroom every time you need to go? How many of them will be next to you, next to your, uh, next to your bed, standing there to help you out because you can't stand, God forbid, right? So do it with the intention of ibadah. This is also ibadah. And tell yourself why you're doing it. I'm doing it because I have to remain fit. If I'm fit, I'll be able to do something remarkable, something that, you know, I'll be able to give something remarkable back to the society. So even when I'm gone, they, you know, there'll be a group of people who will become sadka jariya for me, inshallah. Do it to obey the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Based on this particular hadith, Put it up, write it down, put it up somewhere that I have to focus on my food, what I'm eating. Do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By being a little careful, if Allah wills, it will lead us to, be, to become better Muslims, inshallah. And it will help us in improving our level of iman as well. We will, inshallah, have a purer heart that will just like, you know, uh, focus on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then everything that we can do also describes as at tayyab right? It's not just what we eat. So this condition is attained by those who observe the manners while eating, how you earn your money for food, that's an action. The way you eat your food, that's an action. And also if you're giving charity from the tayyab, that's also an action. So uh, we will then be from the tayyab people, uh, the pure people, uh, people who are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. Now, uh, what we are going to do is um, I want you all to do a, a small little exercise before you leave today. Uh, there are two things that I want you to do right now. 
pick your phones up right now pick your phones up okay and i want you to send a message to your mentors all of you the students the listeners and the and and our uh, uh, the, uh, the people that we have who are who are listening to the recording later on even you've got mentors right there's one contact person for all of you right uh, so i want you to send a message to your mentor right about three things that you're going to reduce or stop eating because it's not good for your health if you think stopping that is you know there's no way i can do it and you have to start from today these ahadith are here with the reason why we are studying is not just to have a close bonding with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but also to implement things in our lives that's very important so every now and then i'll be asking you to do certain exercises and i want the mentors to do that as well i want the mentors to you know pick their phones up and send me uh, you know a list of three things that you will either reduce or you're going to stop eating from today inshallah taala and uh, because they're not good for your health that's one exercise theek hai acha the other exercise in the same chat the second thing that you have to mention uh and then you can if you think it's too personal then you can just uh one karke you write three things i don't think we we all can write what we are planning to reduce but the second thing is a little more sensitive so it's up to you either you just write done for your mentor or you mention at least one or two things that you can identify in your house it could be a plastic container it could be someone's pen it could be a book it could be something belonging to your children's friends something belonging to your husband's office it could be anything that is in your house right now that you have to make sure that it goes back to who it belongs theek okay? hai that's not too difficult and if you do this exercise you write down let's say if you are not able to find anything alhamdulillah you still write down you at least checked your house you looked for things that were belonging to other if if there is something lying in your cupboard something lying in your kitchen something lying anywhere maybe in in the trunk of your car it has to go back in the next one or two days theek okay? hai so these are the two exercises that you have to write you have i hope you have all opened your phones and your mentors should immediately like immediately as in like as soon as i end the class should right now get an answer from you about if you can't identify three things that you want to reduce or quit at least identify one thing that you're going to reduce or quit identify two things likewise so do both the exercises need to be done uh take your time and do it before you get up from wherever you're sitting and taking the class right subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh